All right. If not, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tonight. Yeah, it's interesting to, to read John especially of the four Gospels there. The one that people think reveals mystery truth more, most frequently is John, they think. Because uh, John uses the word believe over and over. and talks about the Spirit over and over. And those are also things that are characteristics of the dispensation. Faith, belief, and the Spirit, right? Um, but those have been characteristics of every dispensation. I mean, it's not that faith was brand new with Jesus. They had to believe in the Old Testament too. And the Spirit was around in the Old Testament too. And they had to worship God in the Spirit. So um, you have to dig a little deeper about, you know, what are they believing? You know, and what's the Holy Spirit doing, and what's happening in your spirit? You know, so, and how do you how do you cause your spirit to do that? How do you worship Him in spirit if you don't have the means to do it? You know, so, all right, Second Corinthians seven. Let's pick it up tonight. We're getting into some fun territory. I told you we'd pick up the pace, and so we'll probably finish the chapter seven tonight, and uh, hopefully get to verse seven in chapter eight as Paul starts to talk about giving according to grace, or grace giving, or giving grace. Chapter 7, we left it last week dealing with repentance and how he was comforted and rejoiced that the Corinthians, after he reproved them, uh, they responded in repentance, godly sorrow. Remember we talked last week about the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And the godly sorrow is a, means, is a reason for rejoicing. Worldly sorrow is not. And so we dealt with that. And, and if you can't control which one you get when you rebuke, then what's, what should you do? Uh, the answer is never to be quiet and don't say anything. You always teach God's word. And so we dealt with that last week more online and on the outline from last week. But we pick it up tonight in verse 11. Paul said, Behold the selfsame thing, godly sorrow, work for repentance of salvation, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation. And so they, all these in response to the, the reproof of sin. Right? Indignation towards the sin, the carefulness that we're going to deal with this, the clearing of themselves, we need to set this straight. Right? What fear, what vehement desire to do right, fear uh, to do wrong, which is a right thing. You know, you should not want to do wrong. And uh, what zeal, again, to get this taken care of and the revenge to inflict what Paul called punishment towards someone for the sin in the, in the assembly. And so they did all that. Remember Paul exhorted them in chapter 2 to forgive him. Now that they've done that, and he repented when they did that, he said, forgive him. That was chapter 2. But he, he's praising them here for their response, their positive response, which is godly sorrow and repentance. In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong. So what he does here is explains in chapter 1 and 2 why he wrote what he did. Okay, was because he, he, he and the Corinthians have the same source of joy and the same God of comfort. Uh, in chapter 2, he talks about, he wrote to them out of the great affliction and anguish of heart and out of his love for them. And then for three or four chapters, he explains his motivation for ministering grace and for doing right at all. If there's no law, why would you do right? And he explains that and how, you know, we have a ministry to do. We have a glory to, uh, to, to gain. We have uh, an eternal position to, to, to have. And, uh, of course, we're going to be facing the Lord in judgment, and we're ministers and ambassadors. All those reasons that motivate you by grace to do right. And then chapter 7, he goes back to the topic, which was, that's why when I wrote unto you, I would rejoice when I heard your response, because I wrote, and you were sorry at a godly manner, and that's good. So see, positive result. And he says, wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that had suffered wrong. Typically, when people have a sin problem in a relationship, and they come to a third party, you, you as the minister or something, to help them deal with it. They want you to choose a side. When someone comes to you and they're like, well, I've got this problem here. Right? This, our relationship's broken. The marriage is falling apart. Or, or th this person has wronged me or something. They're coming to you uh, as a minister to have you say, you're the right one. That person's the wrong one. Let's go and get our pitchforks and you know, tar and feather. That's typically what happens. Uh, and they're, they're never, there's never really a, a thought of, Maybe I had something to do with the wrong, right? There's never that. Uh, there's never this kind of sorrow. It's always this, let's, let's gang up towards the other person. Well, Paul's saying here in verse 12, I did not write it for the cause of the wrong person to, to get after them, right? And I didn't even write it for your cause, you know, to protect you or attack you. He said, I'm not picking sides here, okay? Which is an important ministerial truth, okay? We minister truth. We don't pick sides. And by that, I mean any side, 
Uh, we're on God's side, period. That's it. Right? We're on the side of the Lord and what he's doing, what he would have you do and what he would do in you. And that's why Paul wrote. He didn't write to say, you're right, I'm going to rally around you and your cause against this sinner, you know, or for the sake of the other person on opposite. He didn't do either one. Okay, he says right here, that he wrote that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. He wrote that they might know that he cared, which is interesting because he didn't write a love letter necessarily, even though at the end he says, I love you. Uh, he wrote a letter of reproof and rebuke. But we've established that already, that reproof and rebuke when done in love is actually a loving act because it helps correct wrongs and separate people from errors that could cause them damage, right? So it's a loving thing to help uh, people get out of that and rescue them from that. When he says in the sight of God there, see there, that our care for you in the sight of God, he's not saying our care for you in your own sight or the care for the other brother in his sight, but the care of you in the sight of God. You see, like he said in chapter 5, I answer to God. I minister so that you can see for your sake and your benefit, but I answer to God alone, not you guys, right? We don't answer to any man but God. So we do what we do for God's sake, for Christ's sake. This is precisely 2 Timothy 2.15 in action, by the way. We quote the verse 2 Timothy 2.15, and this is that in action. The verse says, Study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right? Rightly divine the word of truth. And we love the last part. We love the study, the first part. But it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Don't forget those two words because we're not studying to boast amongst people around you that I know stuff you don't or that I work harder than you. Or, that's not it. Okay? It's unto God because we're his ministers. We work together with him to do his service that he would have done on the earth. And so we're unto God, uh, studying to show ourselves approved, and then as workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. So as unashamed workmen. So a shameful work, uh, we covered last week briefly, it'd be shameful for someone to continue walking in sin after they hear the gospel. Like they just love doing it, like they desire to do it, they're going to go do it, you know. It's that, that's a shameful thing. It's also shameful if that occurs and there's sin and people see that, well this guy doesn't even acknowledge that he's sinning here, and there's a rebuke out of love saying, look this is wrong, you know, this is not what God would want done. This is not righteous. And people respond to that in a worldly, sorrowful way like we talked last week. They respond saying, hey, we don't care. Right? This is also shameful. Right? Paul says in Ephesians 5. And so that Paul spends time with the Corinthian church to minister to them, to get them saved and see them grow in the truth. If he spends this, all this time in this work, and all of a sudden, because of their response to sin and to Christ and grace, they're walking in their sin, like they just continue walking after the flesh, Paul is worried that his labor will be spent in vain, right? And so the diligence, the, the, the attention, the studying you do in the Word of God uh, to show yourself prudent to God is to do the work faithfully and rightly to other people so that they can actually be saved and grow. Does that make sense? And so what Paul's saying here in verse uh, 12 is that uh, our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. He is not partial to any of the parties there. First Timothy 5, 20 and 21, he exhorts Timothy in the same way. Don't, be, don't show partiality, is what he says. Uh, Lay hands suddenly on no man, need to be a partaker of other men's sins. Um, verse 21 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing in partiality. It may be a lot easier in our flesh to be, prefer someone who thinks like us, prefers things like us, looks like us, acts like us, and they're in the church with us, they're brothers and sisters in Christ with us, to prefer them over the brother that's not like us, doesn't think like us, doesn't believe like us, is not in the building with us. It's much easier to do that. If Paul's saying in ministry, you can't prefer one or the other. Does God judge one over the other showing partiality? Because you've been going to church every day for 50 years, I'm going to judge you differently than this guy over here. Is that, is that the case? No. It's all the same standard by which all are judged. No partiality, right? And so if we're saved by grace, for example, and the brother in Corinth sinned, and Paul even says, because he's done this sin, and he doesn't acknowledge the sin, he's not going to repent of it, and you guys aren't dealing with it, I'm going to deal with it. I'm telling you to kick him out. For your sake, for his sake. Remember that in 1 Corinthians? Right? He wasn't showing partiality. He wasn't saying, I like you guys better. I don't like him. He's out. Right? He wasn't doing that. There was a wrong, and that had to be addressed. 
which is shown in 2 Corinthians, when that brother repented. When he repented, Paul says, bring him back, forgive him. Now, these guys, he just told them to send them out. They're going, wait a minute, Paul. He's an evil dude. He, he did that sin. You know, you said he didn't belong here, you know. And he did. And Paul says, well, he repented. Then you show forgiveness. And they're going, this isn't fair. What do you mean it's not fair? You received grace just like he received grace, didn't you? When someone sins the body of Christ, does it change the position in Christ? No. The fact that you didn't sin their sin, does that mean your position is better than their position? No. Does the some of their blessings get depleted once they sin and you didn't sin? No. We all I have all spiritual blessings. So to think of other people in the body of Christ as all equal members of the body of Christ, this is not showing partiality, right? And even beyond that, to think of unbelievers as like us, not that they're believers are in the body, but they're like us in that we were sinners needing God's grace. We didn't do anything to get put in the body. We believe the gospel and Christ did it all, right? And that unbeliever who walking in their sin and not repenting, you know what? That was you before you got saved. No difference, right? If God shows you partiality over that person, that person can never get saved. Do you get it? So to look at someone else and say, well, God shows them grace just like he showed me grace, you start to have sympathy and pity and desire and a care to help them rather than, well, now that I'm saved, I'm better than them and God treats me differently. He only treats you differently because of Christ, not because of who you are, right? So all this is partiality, this doctrine here. And Paul says, I didn't do it for your cause or for that brother's cause. I'm doing it because it's right in the sight of God and that you might know that we care for you and care for truth. We care for God and his truth and so that you might know that we care for you regarding that. That you walk in truth, no matter who you are. Not just the best of you walk in truth, all of you walk in truth, right? And so that's what he's saying here. And let's come to Timothy 2.15 in action here. His intentions were to show that he cared uh, the sense there is like Proverbs 13, or, where a, uh, a child who is not disciplined there, it, it says in Proverbs 13, I'm really butchering the verse, it says that you hate your child if you don't reprove them, if you don't discipline them. You hate them. In Hebrews 13, 7, it, he's quoting the Old Testament and says that, you know, a father doesn't love his son if he doesn't chasten him. It's this kind of idea, you know. Now, God's not chastening us today, but Paul is definitely doing that as a father of the faith. There's a reproof and rebuke. So he's doing it. For, with the intent of showing love. Look at verse 13. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Some happy people here. Paul's happy and joyful. Titus is happy and joyful. And why are they happy and joyful? Remember? The Corinthians responded positively to their reproof and rebuke. Okay, it would have been a sad situation if, as a response to the rebuke, they were even harder in their hearts. But they weren't. They repented. Right? And this is a great teaching to recall because this shows that when you've done wrong, uh, the thought enters your mind, well, I've, I've lost, I've been climbing the mountain of righteousness and I've lost a few steps. That's not the mountain, you're not climbing a mountain of righteousness. You're made righteous, right? And when something's wrong or you've been walking wrong or you've been wrong or someone else does wrong, repentance and forgiveness is the answer. And that's great. And so it's not that we sin so that we can have this joy, but it's a joy to see people change their mind about their sin and for others to forgive them. That's the joy. So even when sin occurs, joy can come of it when repentance and forgiveness is given, right? That's the idea. We don't sin to bring that about, but it's an opportunity to show grace, right? And so that's important. And so Paul here is joying, and Titus is joying, because his spirit was refreshed by you all because of their response, right? Because of their obedience is what he says later. He says, I was comforted in your comfort. We were comforted in your comfort. The word comfort there has to do with being strengthened. We'll talk about that in a few weeks on Sunday. Comfort means to strengthen someone. And so they were strengthened. We think of comfort like pillows, and it's not what it's talking about here. Comfort in the Bible is dealing with strength. Right? When you're weak, you need comfort. Because you're weak, when you get strengthened, you don't need comfort. Right? But so comfort is, has to do with strengthening your inner man. And he says, we were comforted in your comfort. The fact that you were strengthened when we rebuked you and it strengthened you, it didn't damage you, that comforted us. It made us stronger. Remember, Paul was kind of on the fence of whether or not he wanted to write that letter. Remember that? And so they were encouraged because they did write. And verse 14 says, For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. So he boasted, remember, we'll cover this more in a couple of weeks. He boasted to Titus about these Corinthians. And he said, these Corinthians, man, they... I mean, you know the Corinthians. Everyone knew the Corinthians. They, they were, this, they were the, the Los Angeles of the first century in the Mediterranean there. 
And, and it's like these guys, uh, they believe Christ, they turn from their idols, and they're on board with grace. I mean, they, they trust the cross, they receive the preaching of the cross, they know his death and resurrection. And so he's boasting about these guys and how grace was working there. That was the boast. And so what a shame it would have been if Titus showed up. And they're going, oh, we don't care about doing right. We don't care about serving the Lord or other people. You know, we're just going to take his grace and run. And what a shame that is. You know, it's, you're kind of like, well, I thought there was the ministry happening here. And it wasn't. It was just people taking and receiving grace in vain. That's why Paul writes them, don't receive God's grace in vain. And so he says that uh, he boasted to Timothy, and I'm not ashamed. He says, I have boasted anything to him of you. I am not ashamed of it. That's 2 Timothy 2.15, right? Unashamed workman. What's the shame that Paul would have felt, as I just described? He spent the work there, boasted to Titus of his work there. If the work came to nothing, <sighs> shame, right? The unashamed workmanship there in 2 Timothy 2.15 then requires us to have that heart and attention to work to edify and to have grace be in people and work in people so that when other people are ministered by them, right, it's a glory and not a shame, right? It's a glory when I hear testimony of you guys talking to other people based on what we've been learning together here and growing together in God's grace and you're ministering to other people. This is a glory. You know, it's a shame when other people run into a grace ambassador or someone that attends and they're like, man, that guy was the, the meanest, you know, ungracious person. I didn't even know he was a Christian. You're like, well, man, you, you kind of just want to, you don't even want to include you in the group, you know, even though it's grace, you know, but there's that kind of ministry response. And so, uh, and that's hard. You want everyone to be a glory and to be a joy. And that doesn't happen all the time. You know, so uh, this is what Paul's saying. I am not ashamed of my boast to you. But this is a joyful thing. But as we spake all things to you in truth, uh, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth because you repented. His work was not in vain. Galatians 4.11, he was scared of the Galatians. I fear lest my labor among you is in vain. Remember? Because well, he feared the Galatians, didn't fear the Corinthians. Why did he fear the Galatians? Because they were trying to walk under the law. He preached the gospel of the grace to them, and they received it like the Corinthians did, and then they started walking under the law. And he's going, maybe they misunderstood me. But you see, if someone misunderstands you by walking under the law, you're going, maybe they didn't know the gospel at all. Now, the Corinthians were boasting that Christ died for their sins, and that's why they could sin. So, I mean, there's really no question they're trusting Christ death on the cross for their sins, even though sin is wrong. The Galatians, however... There's this fear. Okay, I ministered the cross to you guys, and you guys think you have to keep the law now, so maybe you didn't get it the first time. Christ did it all. Right, and that's what he's talked to Galatians about. But he feared lest his work there was in vain. Went up in smoke. And that type of work does go up in smoke. You know, the judgment seat and this sort of thing. You know, poor workmanship, not preaching the gospel, not following up with that sort of thing. As Paul does in many of his epistles, he's following up with the work that he did to make sure these people were on track. Reproving and rebuking and correcting to make sure they get it. If they minister and then they don't get it at all, you get the judgment seat and who's, who, who made it to heaven if they didn't hear the gospel plainly? Not them, you know. So you, there was some work and it, it didn't turn out to be anything. And so, see, Paul counts his ministry as valuable and I'm going to minister the gospel to them. And then when I see that maybe some mistake or some error, I'm going to reprove and correct so that, you know, this is certain, this is sure, you're going to be a jewel in heaven, right? That, that's the reward there. So Philippians 2.16 is the same thing. He says that uh, to the Philippians, he exhorts them to work out their salvation. Remember? Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul's ministry is on the line based upon how they grow. That doesn't seem fair at all. How, how is my workmanship judged by how other people grow? Because you've been called to serve other people. <laughs> and if other people aren't served by you, then you tried, you know, <laughs> and praise God for his grace. You know, I'm not saying you get some sort of, you know, basement room in heaven or something. I I'm simply talking about the successful ministry of seeing souls saved and saints edified, right? And so we ought to have the zeal, the desire to see that actually done. And Paul praised the Philippians that they would hold forth the word of life so that his ministry wasn't in vain. See, the care for, for that message working in them. In 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 15 then, his inward affection, Titus's inward affection, is more abundant towards you, whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. What a great testimony. So Titus was sent to Paul and didn't reject him, ignore him. They received him and, and obeyed what he had to say and heard what he had to say with fear and trembling. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things because of their response. 
Titus's love for them grew. Paul's confidence grew all due to their response to his rebuke. This is how you grow stronger spiritually and how you have more confidence in one another and can actually work together and, and depend on one another when you realize, look, if I do something wrong, they're going to point it out. You know, we've had uh, people teach here before, Faithful Men Project and all that stuff, and some, some of the guys, some of you guys are, you know, a little worried, well, if I say something wrong, you know, oh, there's, a, there's an environment where that's safe, <laughs> right? Because we care for your growth and understanding. And so there's a mess up, they're saying something wrong, then we're going to correct it. We're going to say, hey, look, you know, this is, this is the right way to think about that. Or th you say this diff differently next time. And that's a loving thing. It's not a scorecard. We're going, I've got to say everything right the first time. This never works in life at all. You see, and so there's this sort of, uh, of, of confidence that you can have with each other, not just that um, you're going to do things right the first time as far as understanding or even in ministry, but that if something happens that's wrong, a faithful brother, a loving brother and sister will reprove lovingly and rebuke lovingly and correct me lovingly so that even when I make a mistake, I got all you guys here to point it out. And, and like, there's a smile on my face. This is great. Because it were only me, I'd make mistakes, wouldn't know about it. And then my enemies would call them out to me, right? They said, this is a problem. Those who are against the truth would discredit the truth based on my mistakes. But if you all can help correct the mistakes, you know, as we're meeting here and growing together, this is a proper and successful ministry. So that's how confidence grows with one another, that when you're allowed to do that. And that's how the relationship and the love grows, too. When, you're, when you, you can trust the other to not damage you, and yet will speak honestly and in love to you the truth. Right? That's a loving relationship. Right? So this is good. So Paul rejoices, therefore, that he has confidence in you in all things, not going to respond biting his head off or respond in uh, rejection of this sort of speaking truthfully. Okay? So in chapter 8, he starts and says, moreover, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, to know, that's what the word wit means, to know, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So he starts talking here about giving grace. Because if you recall, a couple chapters ago, he started the chapter out saying, we beseech you, brother, not to receive the grace of God in vain. Remember that? Don't receive it in vain. What do you mean by that? You receive grace for salvation, but you never participate in the ministry of it. Right? Receiving it in vain. So you received it and you're saved, and nothing comes as a result of your workmanship and the Lord. Right. So chapter six was all about approving yourself a minister. And he listed all the criteria by which you can prove your ministry. Right. Uh, and trying to help them in that regard. So he, he's kind of continuing on that series uh, from chapter six, seven, eight, nine. He's challenging these Corinthians to not just receive grace, which they've done, but not receive it in vain, which means you're going to have to give grace or minister grace. That's the topic of these three chapters. Now, people just superficially see chapter eight, nine and say, Paul's talking about money. Yes, he is talking about money, but not only money, as we'll see. He's talking about grace working in you so that it works out of you and that you know it's more blessed to give than to receive. I mean, give anything. Give everything. Give to other people to help them, right? It's not all about you receiving. It's about you giving. God gave you grace. Thus, we, motivated by love and grace, give to others. That's the idea, all right? And not, and not only others, but the things that God values being done. Right. So that's what we're going to be dealing with the next couple chapters. So moreover, we, we would have you know, Paul says, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia. Macedonia, it said, received God's grace. So this is the beginning of the account. The example of grace abounding in Macedonia, abounding out of them, is that they received God's grace. So it was bestowed on them. Right. Um, and how was it bestowed on them? Remember chapter 6, verse 4, or chapter 7, rather, verses 4 through 7? He says, Great is my glorying of you, in verse 4. In verse 5, when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side, without our fightings, within our fears. Now, he's in Macedonia, and we covered that back then, talking about Paul. No doubt it was Paul, but not only Paul. Paul had companions. In Macedonia, he wasn't just, you know, in the dark corner of the alleys. There was a church there. So when he says, we had fightings without no doubt, there's a, pe there's a group of people there suffering affliction, a church. You know, the affliction had to do with those in the town, those religious oppositions or the secular opposition to their ministry, right? And what they were doing, that was the affliction. And not only that, but some of the poverty that was there, they just didn't have a lot of the resources that Corinth had, you know. And so they're suffering there. But in verse 5, in these fightings and fears, verse 6 says, Nevertheless, God that comforts those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Remember that? 
So Titus comes to Macedonia and comforts, and we studied in chapter 7, he comforts Paul. But in chapter 8, we're learning, it's not only Paul that they comforted. It was the church in Macedonia. The grace of God bestowed on the Macedonians. We would have you know this because I just told you how you comforted me. I told you how you comforted Titus, and I'd have you know you comforted the church in Macedonia too. Right? That's what he's saying. Right? You comforted them, you strengthened them, God's grace. But he says the grace of God. He doesn't say you guys, the Corinthians, right? Because what would that have served? It, it, Paul was judging here, uh, rightly perhaps, that that may have served to puff the Corinthians up. Well, we did something, great. Well, that's not the point. The point is God did something, right? God did something to save them by his grace. God did something to, in Paul's heart, work up the courage to rebuke them. God worked something in the Corinthians again when they responded in godly sorrow and repentance, right? And then God worked something in the Macedonians, the fact that they cared about the things of God when they heard the Corinthians' repentance, it comforted them, right? Like God's working all of these places, you see. He's working in people, right? And their uh, belief in the word of God and how they respond to circumstances. Do they do something? They don't do something? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? That's how God works, to change your mind about the circumstances, right? So that your spirit and your inner man can be strengthened, comforted, right? That's how he works. And so the Macedonians had God's grace bestowed on them. And in chapter 6, verse 1, the idea is that they didn't receive it in vain, right? They, they received God's grace. Now, the churches of Macedonia, before we proceed here, we have to identify who these are. Do you know where Macedonia is at? It's not a church down there on, 20, on uh, 19, uh, Macedonian church over there. Uh, it's a, a place north of Greece, or, or part of Greece. It's north of uh, Achaia, north of Corinth, and north of uh, Athens. Okay? It's the place, the area, the region, where Thessalonica and Philippi and Berea existed. When we're talking about the churches of Macedonia. We've got a couple letters to the churches of Macedonia. Philippians and Thessalonians. You can read about them. So he's talking about those people in chapter 8. So it's neat in that you will read a couple of those passages. You can learn more about those churches by reading this epistle. And you can learn more about what Paul's talking about here by reading those epistles. Right? It's amazing how integrated a lot of these epistles are. They're not just random letters that were collected by Paul. In fact, uh, we studied in our Acts series, verse by verse. Remember? We studied Acts in the, the, the middle chapters there, Paul's missionary journeys, his apostolic journeys, excuse me, his ministry journeys to establish the churches there. In chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, almost all those chapters, every chapter, he goes to a new place and he establishes a new church. And it's not a coincidence that the stories in Acts, the accounts in the book of Acts, match up to the epistles that Paul writes. You'll see one chapter talking about Thessalonians, Thessalonians and there's epistles, Thessalonians. You'll see another chapter in Acts 16, he goes to Philippi, and there's a book to the Philippians. Another chapter, he goes to the area of Galatia, over there in Antioch, and he's got an epistle to the Galatians. Everywhere Paul goes, there's an account in the book of Acts. There's a letter that corresponds to it. And it's amazing, when you read the letter, you actually see some similarity in the account where it talks about Paul going there and the things that he suffered or how they responded. You see a similarity to the letter that he wrote. And so you see Galatians, for example, right? Struggle with the law, right? Well, you had this account in, in the book of Acts where Paul's in that area there and there were Judaizers there, right? Or about the Philippians, where in the book of Acts, Paul goes to prison in Philippi, Okay, and he writes to the Philippians, the letter there from prison, helping to comfort them because the things that he learned while he was in prison in Philippi. <laughs> and so it's just neat how they connect. But anyway, that's another lesson for another day. Um, these churches in Macedonia are Philippi and Thessalonica. That's who they are. Now in verse 2, he says, How that in a great trial of affliction, when God bestowed his grace upon them, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So what he's saying here, what he's going to explain, is that when the grace of God was given or bestowed upon the Macedonians, when it was given to them, they received it. The response from them was grace out. Grace in, grace out. That is grace working in someone when grace doesn't get sucked up by a sponge, but rather overflows and starts pouring out of them. That's how you know grace is working in them. How you know so grace is not working in someone? When they're a black hole of grace. You know, it's just like... Going, where, where's it going? Well, it's just, it, they need an abundant, I mean, more and more and more. We need more and more and more, right? And, and that's reality when you're looking at your sin the whole time, right? You're looking at your flesh, you're going, I need grace. And the grace never stops because I need it because you're focusing on your sin and your flesh. I need more and more and more grace. Well, when do you stop that kind of self condemnation and that black hole sponge of grace? You know, it's when you walk after the Spirit, right? When you realize who Christ made you to be, then suddenly you're going, you have grace, you know? 
Because now I'm strengthened by the Spirit. I'm walking out of the Spirit. I'm going to give grace to you because it was given to me. And so you have this kind of grace outworking, right? That's when grace works to change you from the inside out, right? Sin needs grace, and grace is abundant over sin, right? But you are no longer counted a sinner in Christ. You're a servant of God, right? And you've received grace so that you might be changed into this new creature in Christ, a, a, a dispenser of God's grace. That's the idea. And so this is what the Macedonians did. He says that, um, I'm going to rephrase it on my outline here, that the result of what he was saying was that there was joy, but joy in great affliction. So he says, in great trial affliction, the abundance of their joy. Do you see that? Now, that may sound familiar to you. Because remember in chapter 6, verse 4, when Paul's listing how they can prove their ministry? Chapter 6, verse 4, he says, how do you... How do you give no offense and not blame the ministry? How do you prove yourself ministers of God? In much patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses. Remember in chapter 4 what he said? Being persecuted but not cast down, right? Grace works in you. You can see it. When in these poor circumstances, you're giving graciously and you're having joy in these bad circumstances. That's how you know grace is working in you. It's hard to tell when things are fine if grace is working in you, even though you can but when you see in affliction and in trials, you're actually doing ministry work and joy is coming out. The things you wouldn't expect to come out from someone who's being beaten down by the circumstances of life. That's how you know grace is working in you. And Paul's saying this. In their great affliction, there's an abundance of joy. Right? You see the response of, of that. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not the circumstances, obviously. And he says in their deep poverty, in chapter 8, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of the liberality. Which again seems so contradictory. It's like, so they're poor, but they were so generous? It seems like if you're rich, you would be more generous. I mean, you have an abundance of money. Which is interesting. They've done the studies on tithers, and they see that as percentages go, rich people give less money of their money than do poor people. It's a fact. The average is about 3% in America. That's the average. And so, of course, you've got both sides. There's people that give the 10%, very few that give the biblical 30% in the Old Testament tithe. There's a lot that don't give anything, right? The average is 3%. And when they study the, the, uh, the income levels of the households that do say that they tithe or give money, you'll see there's an increase in the percentage the poorer that they get. Now, I'm not trying to glorify poor people or something. I'm just saying that's what they've seen. And the richer people get, the less percentage of their money they give. I'm sure they may think that, you know, well, smaller percentage, but a larger amount. <laughs> what does that mean? So, you know, when you have less, people are giving more percentage of their pie. Doesn't that mean that they're more generous? You know what Jesus taught in his earthly ministry, right? So, who's, who, who, what, how did he say that? Um, uh, who's more thankful that their sins are forgiven? Right, remember that? The person who has one sin or a thousand sins. Right? Well, the person who has a thousand sins is more grateful that their sins are forgiven because they have more sins, right? And so, you know, the, the idea that you know, if you have less and you've given more of that, even though it's a, a smaller amount, you know, you're more generous. That's the conclusion there. But here we're talking about grace and the motivation for that generosity. Because we're not under the law of tithing or anything like that. Paul's not talking about the law here. He's talking about their poverty abounding to their liberality. What would cause them to be liberal, to be generous, even though they were poor? What would cause this? There's no law telling them they have to. In fact, no one would deny that, hey, you're poor. You need to keep this for yourself. Right? Especially under grace. And Paul was not there begging of them. You can read that in other epistles. He's not there going, you guys need to pay up. I mean, come on, I'm a speaker. I've got to pay my bills. He's not doing that to the Philippians. Okay? He says in Thessalonians, I work night and day. Remember that? So I would not be chargeable unto you. Remember those verses? They're in Thessalonians. Why are they in Thessalonians? Thessalonians were poor. So Paul's not saying, pass the hat. He's going, I work night and day. Remember? Just like you have to work night and day. I work night and day, so I would not be chargeable to you. And he was saying that as a pattern, because there were people there trying to claim that you need to pay up for your brother and sisters. And he's going, you guys need to work. If you don't work, you don't eat. I mean, literally. They were poor. If you don't work, you're not going to eat. It's not like savings account. They're not going to eat. And so Paul gave that pattern of actually working. Right? Not sitting around waiting for the daily bread from heaven, but working. You know? And so, anyway, that's, you can read that in Thessalonians. But he says that Macedonians, Thessalonians, Philippians, in their uh, deep poverty, abound to the riches of the liberality. I've seen this in, and I don't have great experience in all of these things, but uh, I do know that based on the, the World Bank and other these organizations, that half of the world lives on less than $200 a month, which is about $5 a day. $5 a day. So, I mean, you'll get a Subway sandwich or, you know, a Big Mac or something like that. 
Uh, that's all they live on for the whole day. And that's everything, not just food, everything. 200 bucks a month is half of the world. A quarter of the world lives on less than, what was it, $60 a month, I guess is what they live on? Quarter of their 25% of the world. And of course, 10%, the extreme poverty, which has, has gone down in the last 10 years. By the last 10 years, it's gone from 40% to 10%. We're in extreme poverty, so it's, it's, it's being reduced. But 10% of the world lives on less than $50 a month, which is $2 a day. You know? And here we are, and we're going, should we go to that restaurant or this restaurant tonight? You know, it's just amazing how wealthy we are when you think about in comparison to the world. I mean, you're poor in America, and you still got cell phones and cable. You know, uh, in other countries, $2 a day is all they got. You know, so, and Paul's talking about these Macedonians being in deep poverty, and yet they're, they're abundant in liberality. They're generous. I remember being over in China, and China is a similar thing compared to Americans. You know, our, our dollar goes a little farther over there when you, when you travel. You become a little richer. And uh, some, some Christians I met over there and how generous they were when I was there. I was a guest. And so they start cooking food for me and inviting me over to their one-room apartments and come over here and you know, we'll set the table for you. And their table is a little thing over here. And I'm going, that's a pretty small table. You know. Who am I to say this? They're so generous. They were so kind with what they had. You know, and yet they had so much less. You know, it's just an amazing thing. I heard a story of one of my friends from the Philippines and they were talking about when in America went over to the Philippines there and uh, a lot of poverty in the Philippines, right? And they come over and their whole family was so excited to see uh, their, their friend come over and, and they said, uh, since you're here and you're our honored guest, you get the mattress tonight. The mattress. <laughs> the mattress? I, mean, I thought this was like a given. I mean, you're poor if you don't have a mattress for every person in America. But there, it's like one mattress. And by the way, the verse is with food and raiment, not food, raiment, mattresses, bedspreads, and headboards. You know, it's like food and raiment, right? And so it's just, we, we tend to forget how much we have. And this is just the physical possessions. I mean, when you start to consider how much God has given us, it, it, remember, spirit and truth, right? What has God done for us? And, and the fact that people don't give graciously is a sign that grace isn't working in them, which is indication that they're not appreciating the grace that they've been given. Because we talked about Thanksgiving a few weeks ago on Sunday, remember? The proper response to someone who appreciates the gift that's been given is what? Mom taught you when you are a kid, thank you. But it's not just the saying of the word, it's the feeling that I need to give something back, but it's a gift, I can't pay for it. So at least thanks, if not, I'm going to give grace to that guy because I've been given grace, Right? You gave me this turkey for Thanksgiving. I'm going to share it with those guys because it was a gift, right? And so you, you, this, this idea of I'm going to pass it on because you appreciate the gift given to you and thus you give it to others. And God's grace works in us the similar way. He's given us abundant grace and abundant spiritual blessings. The Corinthians had all those spiritual gifts, remember? They had spiritual gifts, but what didn't they do? Give to others. That's interesting. Now, they were kind of boasting in their spiritual gifts. We look what we can do and can say and the powers that we have. Well, it was all given to you, Paul said. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 4? What do you have that was not given to you? Christ saved you. Christ gave you eternal life. Christ gave you those gifts. And you're not going to use them for other people? I mean, Paul was almost that plain in 1 Corinthians, right? Rebuking them because grace wasn't working in them. They were a black hole. They just wanted to receive and get, get, get. You know, it wasn't changing their heart at all. That's for sure. That's what grace is supposed to do, change the purpose of your heart. And so here, the Macedonians, of course, is this example of grace working, of grace abounding in the Macedonians, because it was bestowed upon them, they received it, and then they turned around and started giving it, right? Oh, this is great. That's, that's, we're rejoicing in this. You know what? We want to do something for them. Why would they have that thought, right? If you, if you give something to someone, and they turn around and say, I want to do something for you someday, what are you thinking? Oh, you don't have to. I know I don't have to, but it's just, it's so, it's so joyful that we, this sort of thing occurs. We covered this back in our Thanksgiving lesson, the proper response to grace, but Paul says that these Macedonians had great liberality and joy because of grace working in. And how, how was this in their circumstances? It's the answer in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness. The circumstances did not dictate how they were gracious to others. Right? The circumstances did not dictate the spirit working in them or not. Okay? Grace works in you, and proper grace giving, we'll cover this in, in a couple weeks, is, is done despite the circumstances. Right? 
When you think you only give grace to others when certain circumstances are met, then you're thinking about grace wrongly. Right? That's not what grace, grace is needed in the worst circumstances. Right? So whether good or bad, grace needs to be given. All the time, grace needs to be given. And I'm not only talking about money. Paul's not either. Right? But that's the idea, because grace will work in you for that. And so Paul's using them as an example to these Corinthians to get them to minister. In verse 3, he says, To their power, their power meaning this, this reality, the performance, this, the fact they received grace, and now that they're, they're joyful and they're liberal, okay, they're generous. For to their power I bear record. I can testify to the performance of what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm a testimony to them. And beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. He's getting ready to explain how he can testify. He says, I'm a witness. I bear record of their performance. They actually did what I'm telling you. Okay? But not only that, they were willing to do it. And I say, what's the difference? It's one thing to say, God gave you grace. We need to show grace to others. And you're going, yep, you're right. I'm going to do it. Right? That's not how these guys responded. That's why Paul uses them as an example here. Right? is because they were willing of themselves to do it. Paul didn't say, these Corinthians, look how they responded, look at this grace God's given you, you should. Paul didn't even say that. And that would have been a fine thing to say. He says that in other epistles. You should do good works, you should, you should. He's going to exhort the Corinthians here, you guys should. That's not wrong. Just different, by the way, than a law. Right? But he didn't even do that. Paul says they were willing of themselves. When they heard of, and received God's grace and heard of the, the repentance and heard of the, the joy and had this joy, they willingly, of themselves, initiated this sort of grace ministry in response. They just did it. And it kind of, you can see here, it kind of shocked Paul. And it, it, they did it even more than he thought could even be possible of a response, which is also typical in ministry. You, you tend to minister grace so much and are used to people just kind of taking it that when someone actually responds to you in grace and response, you're going, whoa! I mean, it's an amazing thing. It really is. To see God working in other people, to take the initiative to do ministry, grace working out of them, oh, it's so rare, but so joyful to see, right? Because that's what you're trying to do when you do ministry, to see God work in other people, okay, and through other people would be the idea. But he says their power here. This power is the performance of it, just like in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, where Paul says uh, uh, that Christ's power may rest on him. When he is weak, Christ is strong. They were poor. They were afflicted. But what happened? Why were they joyful and liberal? The power of Christ was working in them. Right? So their power is actually the power of God, the power of Christ working in them here. Um, Romans 15, 13, Paul talks about this idea of power too. He says that the Holy Ghost works in these people. Romans 15, 13. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. And hopefully you understand that joy and peace from the doctrines of grace that we've talked about that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Right? The power of the Holy Ghost, that when you are a sinner, Christ died for you, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you're a sealed and a member of his body. Right? The Holy Ghost dwells in you and can work in you when you walk after that Spirit. You abound in hope and charity to other people. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. When because of God's grace, you're abounding in, in faith, your faith is stronger, your hope and your charity to others, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. Okay, so I know sometimes we get kind of, you know, kind of uh, fuzzy about when we can tr claim the Holy Spirit's doing things. Well, the Scripture's saying the Holy Spirit is doing that. He bears fruit in you because of the gospel, because of God's grace, right? So thank God for that. Colossians 1.11 is the same thing where he tells praise to the Colossians that God would work in them. In Colossians 1.11... He says that you might grow in wisdom and spiritual understanding. You've got to know some things first. You know the things that you might walk worthy, so a worthy walk. And then you increase in the knowledge of God. And then verse 11, you're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. The working of God in you is in poor circumstances and in your poverty, right? In your afflictions, in your flesh, in this world, you see grace and love and joy pouring out of you. That is God working in you because of Christ, right? And so this is what Paul's saying. This is the, the growth of the Christian. You get understandings so that you might walk worthy, so you can be strengthened with the inner man and his glorious power, that you might have patience and long suffering with joyfulness. That's the Macedonians, right? That's what he's saying here. Look at 2 Corinthians then. 2 Corinthians 
He says in chapter 8, verse 3, beyond their power, not only their performance of it, their power, they were willing of themselves, is what he says. They not only performed, but they took the initiative to perform. This is like Acts 17, 4, where Paul went to Berea, or went to Thessalonia, rather. He went to Thessalonia first. And he ministered there. And it says in Acts 17, 4, that the people received Paul. They believed him. They received grace. And then they consorted with him. Little statement. You kind of read right past it. They didn't only receive him. They weren't even just noble not to kick him in the face, which like the Bereans. They also didn't do that. It was the unbelieving Jews, by the way, that were not noble in Thessalonians, not the believers. The believers, they received Paul, you know, this, the people who heard it and received it, they were believers. And it says, and they consorted. So not only did they believe and receive, they consorted, which means they joined with him, participated in the ministry. And it's actually that part that caused the unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica to cause an uproar in the city. Because if Paul were preaching and people just believed it and they kind of went home, there wouldn't have been an issue, I don't think, right? Which is... I think perhaps why the Bereans didn't have really a big uproar. Either they didn't receive it, which never says they did, or secondly, they believed, received it and never says they didn't think about it. You don't hear about the Bereans anywhere else. But in Thessalonia, people received it and they consorted with him, which means they joined and participated in his ministry. And as a result of that, there was this great uproar in Thessalonia. Okay, Thessalonica, because the unbelievers then heard all this group growing and preaching and doing work. Remember in 1 Thessalonians, that epistle? Paul says, I remember your labor of love, your work of faith. Remember that? They started doing work, performing grace ministry, and that's what was causing all the problems in Thessalonica. Because the unbelieving Jews and the religious folks there who didn't believe, they started opposing them. Now you can see, you can have two reactions to that. God doesn't want us to minister, <laughs> right? Or, this is truth. I receive grace, I got to give grace, and the fact they're against it means they're against God. I mean, this, this, that's the other response. And so the Thessalonians were, were very zealous in that regard. Re read First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, they did what they were supposed to do, and Paul praises them for them and tries to comfort them because they were being persecuted for their doing grace ministry there. So anyway, they were willing to themselves, what Paul says, like the Thessalonians. Pa Paul left Thessalonica because these unbelieving Jews were trying to kill Paul. He fled to Berea. That's how he got there. And then the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica went to Berea and chased him out of Berea. And then Paul went to Athens. Remember, he fled to Athens. And then he turns back to Thessalonians, and he, and he hears a report from them that even though I left, you guys are still working over there. And that's why he writes that letter of 1 Thessalonians. He goes, this is great. You guys are still working over there. So you actually received what I said in truth as the word of God. And you're actually doing what the Holy Spirit would have you. I mean, you're, you're doing it. Like, Paul's amazed at 1 Thessalonians that, you know, it, it worked. It stuck. And, and the ministry's growing there. And he's praising them for that. But this is what he's saying. They were willing of themselves to do this thing. Okay. So again, that's an example. If you're looking for a church example, Thessalonians is not a bad one. It's a pretty good one. Paul uses them here. And by the way, with, without this kind of giving, okay, this kind of ministry, growth in the church never gets off the ground. It's hard. When you have one guy, right, Paul, and he's there ministering. He's one guy. But the church really grows and gets off the ground when you have a number two and number three and number four and number five. And that we say, well, obviously, it's numerical. But it's not just the numbers. It's when they receive grace and then they start taking initiative to, in themselves to perform grace ministry. That's where growth happens. If it were just about numbers, getting people to, to listen to me, you can get people in the pew or getting, get people to agree. You can get that a lot faster than you can get people who willingly in themselves do grace ministry. And that's where real deep spiritual growth occurs. You see what I'm saying? And so this kind of giving here, this grace giving of, he says in the next verse in chapter 8, they gave of themselves. That kind of giving, that's ministry work, and that's where God's grace really shines in people. By the way, that is the goal of grace working in you. Grace is not given just to save you. Grace is given to work through you. Okay? That's the idea. And the Corinthians were missing that point. And so, Colossians 4, 17, Paul exhorts Archippus over there, and he says, tell Archippus that he perform, he, he prove his ministry, because he has a ministry, and he hasn't done it yet. He says, make full proof of your ministry, Archippus. What's he saying? You've received grace. You need to do something with it. Right? Well, he's telling the Corinthians, too. You received grace. What, what's happening with that? Right? Verse 4 in chapter 8, praying us with much entreaty. So, they were willing of themselves, and what did they do? So they did something that Paul didn't encourage them to. They just did it, willing of themselves, and they responded, like, to do this ministry. What was this ministry? It says in verse 4, praying us, asking us, right? Praying us with much entreaty. 
So they didn't just ask him, hey, Paul, can you do this? I mean, they're like begging him. They're like, you know, forcing him, pushing him. You know, Paul, we want to do this thing and you got to help us because nobody else, you got to do this thing because we want to do this thing, right? Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. What is he talking about, receive the gift? Didn't he just say in verse one, the Macedonians received grace? Yeah, they received grace. And then as a response in their affliction and poverty, they responded in generosity and joy and entreated Paul, take this thing, take this gift so you can do minist- more ministry somewhere else. So see, they didn't just take the grace and receive it themselves and go, this is great. Which they were joyful in that. It made them joyful. But they responded in grace working through them saying, Paul, take this gift. We entreat you to take this and do the ministry that you, only you can do over here. Right? In verse 4. He said, receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. The us there is Paul, Right? So Paul's there, Titus comes, tells the report, everyone's joyful, Titus, Paul, the Macedonians. The Macedonians take the initiative, stand up and say, hey, we got an idea here, let's do this ministry. And Paul, you're the one to do it, because you travel around, you know, we're stuck here. And so they entreat Paul to take this gift and take this ministry, this fellowship of the ministry of the saints. It's an amazing thing that happens here. The joy, liberality, and zeal to give a gift. Do you see that here? The joy, liberality, and zeal for Paul to take something from them, a gift. That is called grace. When you give someone to someone, it's a gift. It's grace. Grace in action is when you're entreating and pushing and and for someone to receive something. This happens sometimes. People come here and they've never been here at Grace Ambassadors and they don't realize that the books on our shelves are not not for sale. When you come here, the books aren't for sale. Because our ministry is to grow in the knowledge of the truth. And so there's free Bibles, there's free books to help edify the saints. And they come here and they they see the books that they want. I say, take them, they're free. They go, oh, no, no, we'll pay something in the back. No, 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 don't pay, they're free. I want them to take it. Because if they don't just take it, it's not grace anymore, is it? I'm a bookstore. You can buy them on Amazon or something, right? So it's this idea that he's saying to the Macedonians, they entreated us to take the gift. Take it. Take it and use it. To do ministry, right? That's grace ministry. That's why we have that ministry here. It's like we're, grace and we're trying to show grace to people. When you come here, not this thing where you email me from Australia and say, send me 50 copies. I mean, who are you? you know? but come out to Grace Ambassadors, we'll give you the free gift. You know? Tell us who you are. We want you to have grace work in you. But meanwhile, it says um, they want to take upon us. Now, when it says take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints there, He's not saying, these Thessalonians, these Macedonians were so lazy, uh, they told us to do something and they wouldn't do it. That's not what he's saying. Okay? He, he, they exhorted him to take upon this ministry, which is not them passing the buck, but it's their starting a ministry, which is an amazing thing. And Romans 15, 26 is what he's talking about. Look at Romans 15. This ministering of the saints. When Paul went to Jerusalem in Acts 15 and spoke to Peter and the guys there about um, the gospel Christ gave to him, Remember, there were a couple of things they said. One of them was, remember the poor. Remember that in Jerusalem? They told Paul, well, if you're going to be out there ministering, Paul, tell those believers out there among the Gentiles to remember the poor. And they weren't just trying to put them under the law or something like that. I mean, because there were poor people in Jerusalem, that was why. In Acts 11, four chapters earlier, there was a famine that a prophet, Agabus, had prophesied there'd be a famine in Jerusalem, and there was. That's why they were poor in part. Another reason, which is probably a lesser reason, but also true, is that Jesus told them to sell everything they had, and they did have all things in common, so they didn't have all the houses and things they had before, right? But it was also because of this famine and the dispensations were changing and all this. But Romans 15, verse 26, Paul says in verse 25, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Paul's doing his ministry, right? Where did he get that ministry from? God didn't tell him to do that. I mean, directly. God didn't say, Paul, I've called you as an apostle to go back to Jerusalem and give them money. He didn't do that. God gave Paul an apostleship of grace to go to the Gentiles. But Paul said, I'm going to Jerusalem now to minister to the saints. He got that ministry from the Macedonians who willingly in themselves, in response to how the Corinthians repented, you see God working through this. They said, we got an idea for ministry. Here, take this and give it to the brothers and sisters over there, to the saints, right? This is a ministry. It's our idea and Paul, you're going to do it. And Paul says, wow, okay. Yeah, I'll help you with your ministry. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so Paul does that in verse 26. It had pleased them, a Macedonian and Achaia, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints for at Jerusalem. You see that? It had pleased them. That's the willing in themselves part. It's not that I forced them. He didn't pass the hat and you know, beg them. They did it. It pleased them. 
It's our joy. It's more blessed to give than to receive, is what Jesus said about grace. And when grace works on people, that's what they think too. Right? It's more blessed to give than to receive. And so, it pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, is what Paul says. Now, he adds that part. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in carnal things. And that's just him talking about a truthful reality, about receiving spiritual benefits and stuff. Uh, the blessings that they received from, from the brothers in Jerusalem have simply to do with the fact that they serve one God and the God of salvation through Jesus Christ. That was a Jewish doctrine where Jesus said, appropriate your question tonight, salvation's of the Jews, John 4, 22. Well, then the Jews rejected it. The Gentiles got it, right? Through the dispensation of grace. And what do you call that? It wasn't that the nation of Israel came out and gave it to them. God gave it to them. But it was the God of Israel. It was the Christ promised to Israel. It was salvation that was at one time promised to Israel, right? It was theirs, and God's saying, I'm giving it freely to all now, you see. And so um, there's this, this connection there where these Gentiles serving who knows what, other pagan gods and idols, now well, who are they serving? The God who was of Israel, the Jesus Christ that was prophesied, who had come and died for our sins and rose from the dead to give grace to all men without distinction, right? And so, I mean, I wouldn't call myself a Judeo-Christian at all, and yet I have a Bible and most of it's Hebrew, right? There's an origin to these things, right? And so there's a, there's a need that we have for historical Israel. Now, I say that specifically. Today, Israel's fallen. But Israel in the past, we wouldn't have this book if it wasn't for them, right? And yeah, they failed. And yeah, they rejected God's grace. But God worked a purpose in prophecy, right? So praise God for David. Praise God for Daniel. Praise God for Abraham, right? I mean, those guys are important to us in the Scripture, you know, they're just not operating in ministry at the time that we are. We all have our task in ministry. And so this is what he's talking about. And the, and the Macedonians had this knowledge. Then, and so they wanted to seek to help them. Upon the outline there, few things are more joyous than to hear a desire to do ministry from the church, which is an amazing thing. It is so true. There's few things more joyous than to hear from the church, like people in the church, that they want to do ministry. Not like the pastor, or like the apostle, like people in the church. Like we want to do it because that's the whole point of the church. Everyone in the church is called to be a minister of Christ and of God. And when they desire to do it, they desire a good thing. First Timothy 3 verse 1 says, right? And so it's a good thing when people desire to do it. And the master has responded that way because of God's grace working in them. So you want to be a good minister? I'm not talking about, do you want to be a pastor? I mean a good minister for the Lord as a member of his body. This is the answer. Be faithful. Let God's grace work in you. Let the mind of Christ be in you. It's, it's required of stewards that they be faithful, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2 says. 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul says the ministry continues by finding faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's you, folks. That's not just like we need to find a new pastor when Justin dies or something. It's like all y'all, right? So when you can get some, you know, some greenhorn up here, hopefully not, you know, but, and you can correct them left and right until they get it right. Because you know the doctrine. You're faithful to it, right? You believe it and you want to see people grow in it, and so that can happen. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 20. The Thessalonians there were faithful in receiving Paul's words as they were in truth, the word of God. It worked effectually in them that believed. And so he says, Ye are our glory and joy because you've received the word of truth. You're faithful to it and you're doing it, you're performing the ministry. We didn't have to ask you to do it. You just do it. And it's a glory and a joy. You, you, you can't understand, you won't know how much ministry you can do as a result of you just doing your part and the positive effect that has on other people the, by joy and, and, and grace abounding in them. You see an example here in the passage tonight. You know what I'm saying? You have your part. And you say, well, I can't do everything. You're not called to do everything. But you do your part. Faithful, right? Grace working in you. Because of the grace you've received from God, it starts working out of you like this, and it starts bumping into this guy, and this guy bumps into that guy. That's what's happening here, right? Because what the Corinthians responded to Paul, they weren't even thinking the Macedonians. The Macedonians heard, and they responded, and now the Jerusalem slates are going to benefit, and the Romans get word of it, See, you don't even know how the response happens when you're faithful to the word. Grace working in you, that's where it all begins. It begins in you, 
then your marriage, then your family, then those around you. That's how it works. But in you first and you always, God's grace working in you. With your affections on the Lord, serving him and with him, right? Meanwhile, it says in chapter 8, in verse uh, 4, they entreated us that we receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, the ministering to. So they exhorted Paul to minister to. What's the point here? Paul's ministry now was supported, was initiated, was encouraged by the grace working in the Macedonians, right? So what keeps people continually preaching and teaching, what keeps ministries continually going, what keeps grace ambassadors keep happening, it's because of the support of you. Please don't hear that word support with dollar signs on all the S's. Yes, that's needed, but not only that. You see what I'm saying? It's the willingness in yourselves to say, we want this to happen. Justin, you can't quit now. We want this to happen, right? That's what happens. That's, that's the joy. That it's not just one person. It's everyone that wants it, right? This is, this is how the church ministers. So Paul's ministry is supported, so that's why he's uh, rejoicing in them, and then he's rejoicing in the Corinthians. Paul has said so much in 2 Corinthians that his own inner man was weak with fightings without and fears within, and he was comforted and strengthened by other people. Not other apostles, not other preachers and teachers, but other people in the church and their willingness to give graciously, to comfort, right? To respond positively to God's word, Right? Meanwhile, let's move on here to verse 5. And he says, this they did. So this thing I'm telling you about their abundance and liberality and joy, and they were willing in themselves, they entreated us to minister to the saints, and this they did, not as we hoped. Now, he's not let down here. He's not saying, we really hope for something better. He's not saying that. He's saying that what they did is not something we were hoping for. We didn't expect it. It was unexpected. Right? And this they did, not as, it's not like we were like hoping and asking and secretly dropping hints so that, oh, okay, they did it. Which, by the way, is exactly what he's doing in the Corinthians, isn't he not? He's writing this letter, kind of like, this is what you do, and this, here's the hint. And it's not a wrong thing to do that, it's just Paul saying in this case, it didn't happen that way. It's not as we hoped. It's something we planned or plotted. <clears throat> it's not as we hoped, but he says, um, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. This they did. Not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Before they gave the money, they gave themselves. To which I read that and I'm just like, amen. God wants people more than money. Okay? You can give all the money of the world to the cause of Christ and without people to minister it, you don't get the sort of abounding and redounding grace that we just explained. Because it has to work in people. It's not just about printing material. There's plenty of Bibles in homes all across America. And grace doesn't work in a lot of people all across America. Right? So what are you going to do with that money? Say, print more stuff. Well, it's, it's not bad to do that, but it's like that's not, that doesn't do all the work. The work is grace working in people. Right? And when people have grace working out of them, they do ministry, that's when results start to occur. The Spirit is in people. The Spirit's not in buildings. And the Spirit's not in signs and in commercials and this sort of thing. Spirits and people. Meanwhile, this example here in the next few verses is an example of the what Paul says in chapter 2, redounding grace. Grace redounding over and over like a wave that keeps getting bigger and bigger. Okay. Paul was not requesting their doing these things. Look at Philippians 4, verse 10. <clears throat> Philippians 4. <laughs> he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly and that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. Do you see that phrase? Not I speak in respect of want. Paul's saying, not as we hope. I wasn't asking the Philippians to give me anything. That's what he says here. It's not that I was asking for anything. But he says, I rejoice in the Lord because your care for me hath flourished again. You have given to me, provided for me. Right? Down in verse uh, 15. 14, you did well to communicate with my affliction. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into my necessity. You see, that's what he's talking about in Corinthians. The willing of themselves. Paul didn't even ask. They didn't, he didn't require it, and they did it. Because they cared for his ministry and were appreciative of the grace that they received through him and through God. Right? 
they started supporting him. And Paul didn't even ask for it. He says, I, it's, I don't need that extra fries on my, you know, happy meal. But he took it, and he took it rejoicing because of what it meant for them, right? He did it because of what this means for grace working in you. You can tell a lot based on how God's grace is working in people based on what they're doing with God's grace. You understand? Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 8, if you love God, it will be known of you. Right? So he says here, verse 16, Even in Thessalonica you sent my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You see, it was their fruit that he's joying over, not that he's got a full belly. But he says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. So Paul's reminding them of the hope that they have in their judgment seat before the Lord, saying, this is a good work, and your ministry is a good thing. I didn't desire it, but it's good. This is Paul writing about the zeal, the, the giving and receiving of the, of the Philippians, the Macedonians. And 1 Thessalonians already talked to you about how the Thessalonians sounded out the word of the Lord to all those that are around them, right? That was the zeal he's talking about, willingly in themselves doing the ministry. Paul writes about that in 1 Thessalonians. And so when you read Philippians and Thessalonians, you, you read that, you read Romans 15 a little different when it says it pleased them to do this. You can see why. Because grace was working through them and out of them. They were doing ministry work. They were giving what they saw necessity and opportunity they gave, right, of themselves first. And then what they, else they saw that was needed. Giving yourself, by the way, that phrase, giving yourself, is the pattern that Christ left us, Right? Christ gave himself for our sins. And we are now crucified with him. I'm crucified with Christ. So our ministry is that of giving ourselves up to death of Christ and then to others in ministry to him. We're members of his body, right? So when he says they gave themselves, he's simply saying the whole doctrine of you're crucified with Christ and it's working in them. I mean, they're giving themselves to other people as Christ told the church to do, Right? And so in verse 6, he says, Insomuch they did this, and they gave themselves and unto us by the will of God, insomuch they did it so much that it affected us. So it comes back on Paul. They entreat him. They give themselves to him so that it affects him that he desires Titus to go back to Corinth. Now, remember, they gave him a gift to give to the Jerusalem saints, right? And Paul's going, you know, this is a good idea. And you really affected me with this sort of zeal or doing this grace work. And he goes, I'm going to send Titus back to Corinth because I boasted to you guys of them, but uh, they really need to perform that, which they said they would do. So I'm going to send them back so that the grace I see working in you guys is going to work in them. It's going to be good. And, so, and that's what Paul says here. He says he desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. What same grace? Did the Corinthians receive God, the gospel of grace? Yes. But the receiving it wasn't the issue. It was the giving it. It was not receiving it in vain. Receiving it not to give it would be in vain. Receiving it in order to give it would be the outworking and the purpose of grace being given. That's the same grace. Now remember Titus, of course, had been to Macedonia once already. He had come back in chapter 7. That's what started this whole thing. He went to Corinth and came back and this, they all rejoiced, right? Paul says, I'm sending them back again with this letter <laughs> telling them how grace motivates you to do good, good works and what the Macedonians responded to their repentance and how he rejoiced in their repentance and how grace should work through you and be given out of you, right? And that's where he gets into the topic in the next two chapters about money because he's talking about this ministry the Macedonians had as their idea to minister to the brothers, okay? By the way, when you deal with money in the church, that's not a bad place for that idea to originate. Is not from the pastor. It's for people who desire to do it, Right? And when you have the leadership in a church requiring other people to pay for their own salaries, this is like Congress voting for an increase in their rate, their salary. And it's just like, everyone kind of knows, wait a minute here. They're their own bosses? What's happening? The same in the church. You know, when you get pastors and elders and they're requiring other people to pay for themselves instead of people willingly saying, that needs to happen. You know, it's a different thing. And that's what Paul's saying. And so he's writing to the, sending Titus over there. And he says in... Um, in verse 7, therefore, as ye abound in everything, the same grace, of course, we described as grace being given. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also, which begins this next section where Paul is going to ask them to prove their love. That's kind of hard, isn't it? But it's all, he's doing it for their own sake. 
He wants grace to work out because Paul truly believes, and it's a fact, and he saw it in the Macedonians, which is why he does this ministry, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. If it's more blessed to give than to receive, what does that mean? When you received God's grace, that's only half the blessing, or less than half the blessing, right? See, we think of it like it's more blessed to give than to receive, so I have something, if I give it, I'll feel happy about it. Well, that's true, but think of it this other way, how... Christ gave you grace. You received it. And you get that. What a blessing that is. And it's a blessing. It is. It's great. It's joyful. It's wonderful. But when Jesus says, it's more blessed to take what I gave you and give it to others. He's saying, it's more blessed to give than just to receive. He's saying that when I gave you grace and saved you, that was just the beginning. Right? When you give it to others and see other people giving it to others, the blessing abounds. You see? And so Paul is trying to minister grace working out of people because if it just stops when you get it and that's it, you're diminishing the blessing that's possible. You see what I'm saying? It's like give it to other people and the blessing abounds, the joy abounds, right? So what Paul's saying. He says that same grace I want to see work in you. I want you to abound in this grace also, right? Just like the Macedonians abounded in it. But notice what he says in the first part of the verse. I thought this was interesting. He says, because he loves them, right? And he's trying to, to exhort them out of love. He says, you abound in everything. In faith and in utterance, you abound in everything, right? And so, if you're abounding in everything, doesn't that mean there's nothing lacking? Well, then you start reading this verse in verse 7, and you see what's missing here. What is missing in this list? Faith. Did they have faith? Yes. They believe and trusted the cross of Christ. They didn't think it was works, obviously. <laughs> it was faith, right? Did they have utterance? The only church in the Bible that boasts in speaking in tongues was the Corinthian church. Yeah, they talked. They spoke in tongues. They had prophets, right? They had utterance. They had opportunity, right? And did they have knowledge? Remember 1 Corinthians? Yeah, they had knowledge. It puffed them up, remember? They had knowledge that puffed them up. What didn't they not have? Charity. It's not in this list. You bound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge. And he says, the bound in this grace also. What's the this grace? Charity. Charity is what? It's grace working out of you. It's truth affecting other people from you. That's charity. So he's saying the same, he's singing the same song. He says, guys, you guys have so much. You have faith, you have utterance, you even have material wealth. You have opportunity. You're not even suffering that much affliction. And I want you to abound in this grace too. It's another way of saying, without charity, you're nothing. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians, remember? He said it kind of harsh there. Without, without charity, if you have not charity, you are nothing. Without charity, you're a uh, you're tinkling symbol. Without charity, you profit nobody, right? Only yourself. But here he says, you abound in everything else, abound in this. So you see a little sarcasm there even. He'll get more sarcastic as the epistle goes on. But he says, you guys abound in everything else because they're so rich. Then abound in charity, right? Is what he's saying. And so we'll get into this next week as Paul exhorts them to have more charity, to tell them that grace that gives is not grace received in vain. And that's what he's exhorting them to do. Right? Any comments? Questions about chapter 8 so far? Those Macedonians were a pretty good example. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for the abundant grace you've given us, and I pray that we would not be such that receive it in vain, but would be that we are thankful for it, which we are, and appreciate it so much that we want to give it to others with the opportunity and the wealth that we have with the words that we understand and with the people that are around us that we would have them know and rejoice in your grace as well. May ministry be done through us, Lord, as you work in us by your spirit, as you promise us these things, if you've given us all these blessings. I thank you, and I pray that grace will work in us. Amen.